Okay. All right, so I do want to let you know uh, that was V just announcing that he is starting recording. Uh, so this presentation is going to be recorded and posted online. So I would ask that you keep your uh, video off uh, just for privacy reasons and also keep your microphones off. Uh, we do encourage people to be asking questions throughout the presentation and towards the end of the presentation, uh, but we just want to keep that background, background noise uh, to a minimum throughout. Uh, so welcome very much. Welcome and thank you so much for joining uh, Epic Week Manitoba Career Fair. Um, we're so thrilled that we could pull this off online. We, we didn't give ourselves much of a timeline, but some amazing things have happened in the background. Uh, my name is Hilary Dukes and I'm the Youth Programming Coordinator at Tech Manitoba. Tech Manitoba is an industry-led association that helps local companies thrive and grow through collaboration, education, and promotion. Uh, we also put a huge focus on supporting youth who are interested in learning more about technology and uh, who are interested in choosing a tech career path. So feel free to check out our booth uh, in the exhibitor area. Uh, we'll be there throughout the day. Um, so uh, Paula will be giving us about a 20-minute presentation half an hour maybe uh, and like I said please dive in if you've got questions you can use your microphone or the chat function uh, and then I'll also offer a uh, time at the end for uh, for questions. Um, so Paulo Fernandez is a co-founder and lead web developer at Luscious Orange uh, a company based in Winnipeg and he's going to be speaking to us about his work in software development. So thank you so much, Paulo, for joining us, and I'll let you dive right in. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. So I uh, this will be fairly informal. I don't have a big presentation set for you. I'm not going to put up a PowerPoint. I'm going to talk to you and tell you sort of what my life looks like in terms of being a web developer, a uh, software developer, uh, how I ended up where I am, the kind of path I took to get there. Uh, obviously, you're all uh, at some point stage in your high school careers and trying to figure out what you're going to do next. When I first was going to high school, when I was going through high school and deciding where to go in, into university, I decided on computer engineering. That's my background. I have a degree in computer engineering. And what always struck me is that I chose to go into uh, a university program and go into a career essentially without ever really talking to anyone about what the job was really like. And so that's why I happily volunteered to do this with Tech Manitoba. Uh, because I think it's really important to hear from people who do the job to understand what it's like. And there's no way I'd be able to explain how software development works on a large scale. It's complicated. There's lots of moving parts. I imagine most of you have probably in some way or another already played with code somehow. Uh, if not, lots of lots of articles online to learn from. So I'm going to give you a bit of background on how I got where I am and that how that path looked. Um, there's a lot of different ways people end up going into software development. Not all of them go through a university education. It's wonderful in that way. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about uh, the industry in general, how it sort of works as a software development developer um, in the day to day life, less so of like what the ups and the, the peaks and valleys look like. That doesn't matter. You'll have lots of crazy highs and fun times when you launch software or something. You'll have lots of moments that are uh, not very much fun uh, chasing down bugs. But uh, the day to day ebb and flow is what really matters because that's what your job is like and that's what you should really hear about. Um, throughout the, the whole thing, I'm I'm open to questions and answers. If you're if there's things you want to ask about, type it in the meeting chat. I'll see it come up here uh, and I'll address the answers as quick as I can. And then, uh, like Hillary said, we'll get to a, a Q&A at the end. But uh, it also works well if it's just in the middle of the flow of the conversation. I'm going to try to not sound too robotic here. Um, so my background is um, born and raised in Manitoba. I graduated uh, from high school. As I said, I went into computer engineering. Uh, and throughout computer engineering, I wasn't always certain that's what I wanted to do. Uh, if I want to go into software development, I probably should have ended up in computer science, more than computer engineering. Uh, two different approaches to the same sort of solution. Um, you kind of learn different things. You have a different approach to problem solving, depending which program you're in. Um, and there's just a, a bit of variance there. But either way, I ended up uh, finishing my computer engineering degree. And all the way through that, I was involved in a lot of other organizations. I did youth parliament and uh, a whole bunch and Toastmasters and a bunch of other things that helped me become 
a well-rounded individual. And I would say, regardless of where you're going, it's important to have other skill sets other than just programming. There's lots of examples of like brilliant programmers who have no idea how to communicate it, and that's not good. So uh, I got involved in student councils and student government and, and all those kind of things. Uh, and so when I graduated, I ended up uh, going out on my own. Uh, my parents had started their own business. They supported me. Uh, I was fortunate to have them back me up. Uh, I started taking on some a lot of design work. I actually ended up doing quite a bit of graphic design alongside the web development. My my path is is very much based around web development. Um, and that forced me to kind of learn how the whole thing works. Uh, and I was on my own for 10 years and I, I built uh, a company that was essentially just me. I was a solopreneur, as they call it. That is a really hard way to go uh, because I was by myself and uh, there's only so far you can go as a team of one. Uh, and so in 2015, I merged with uh, someone who I've known for years through uh, engineering as well. Uh, he had done a lot of design work. I started doing some web development. We talked about, you know, maybe working on projects together. And then we formed Luscious Orange uh, exactly five years ago to the day. So today's our five year anniversary. Um, and we slowly started growing. We started taking on more web development projects, more complicated web programming projects. We took on some design work. Um, and eventually we grew our team. We're now six people in total, uh, three developers, of which the team I lead, uh, two designers and a content strategist. Uh, and so my business partner runs the business development and the, the graphic design side. So uh, that's, that's how we sort of grew. Uh, and it happened slowly. It wasn't a massive, hey, 20 people, let's hire. It's not how it works. Uh, it takes a lot of time to train and mentor someone. Um, and so, that's how we sort of came about to starting our company and, and working in that way. And along the way, we started building more and more complicated web projects. And so when I talk about software development specifically, I'm going to talk about web development. But that doesn't mean that most of the things I say don't apply to all kinds of software development. Um, you can end up doing uh, app development, game development, you know, uh, all these different areas, you know, that all intersect. And it's really one big ecosystem now, and they all rely on each other. Uh, there's entire elements of software development that isn't about writing code. It's about making sure that coders have the infrastructure to build code effectively. It's called uh, developer operations or DevOps. So there's an entire system that's just based around making sure that things run smoothly for all the other programmers. It's a really interesting field. Um, there's people who end up doing uh, database management, and they become essentially database programmers a very different environment than someone building games. It's all software development though, right? And they all rely on a huge collection of other people out there uh, helping to make it happen. So uh, regardless of where you sort of end up uh, in the software development world and, and, and whether or not you end up going down this path or th that path, in the beginning, what you're gonna have to realize is that it's really hard to get a sense of what you're gonna want to do. And the advice I always give is don't look for the things that you're good at that you think you might do. What you actually want to do is identify the stuff that you hate. Like there's certainly some classes that you probably don't enjoy. Uh, and there's probably some classes that, um, you know, you really don't uh, find that interesting or you just seem to struggle with. And when you start narrowing down inside of a field like software development, it's really important to identify the kind of stuff that you're just like, Ugh, that's the worst. I hated it. It doesn't sound fun. Why would I ever want to do this? That is really, really valuable. Because when you're in, interested in a field, like when you, you know, if you go into computer science, computer engineering, um, you do like a one-year program uh, that exists, you know, sort of technical programs. When you go into any of those programs, you're going to be exposed to so much stuff that seems interesting. And so it's really hard to identify. And usually a bit of overlap, right? It's not like this distinctive, like, I choose a path, I go there. So I think that's one of the really important things to sort of figure out when you're looking at this is to make sure that you identify the things you don't want because it makes it a lot easier and to focus your time on things you do want. And it's usually a mix. Um, I think one of the other things I'm going to talk about is going to be in terms of how do you experiment, right? And, you know, not every industry gives you the ability to sort of try it out. You know, if you want to go... Uh, Let's use uh, virology, seems very uh, relative, relevant right now. So let's say that you want to become a, a virologist. Okay, it's really hard to go play with um, 
you know, biological equipment that studies virology. Programming isn't the case. You need a text editor, probably some documents online, find a tutorial. And so you can really spend a lot of time experimenting. And that is equally important to the educational path you take because you want to sort of figure out what you enjoy. And in general, the educational system isn't there to give you a really deep analysis on a given topic. It's meant to show you a wide range of things and cumulatively build up your skill set so you have this baseline, right? And that's what software programming core, uh, programs do. They build up your baseline. They give you a, enough information about a bunch of different topics. So when you go out into the workforce, you can adapt to what you're being asked to work on because then you're going to go deep on one or two topics. And so in software development, you're really fortunate that you can actually try it out and you can figure out what you like and you don't like. And there's endless courses out there, free courses, tutorials, all those kinds of things that would let you experiment with it. Uh, and so I really say that's that's an Im important part of it. Um, I don't have a, a ton of specific things. If people have questions, of course, uh, please jump in and, and, and type them in or just say you want to raise your hand if you have something. Um, those are the two main things I really want to talk about is finding the path to getting there and deciding if it's right for you. Um, so unless there's particular questions, I'm going to talk now about the the, the day to day. So what did my day look like? Well, my day's a little odd. Um, and the reason, sorry, the reason I talk about the day to day is because uh, it's really important to get a sense of what the job looks like. So often when you look at someone's job, it's, oh, what's it going to be like? you oftentimes end up with like a very glorified version, right? Um, most software development is not what you see on social media, like these big crazy moments. It's definitely all it looks like on TV with like things like flying by you. And in general, programming is portrayed pretty inaccurately on, on TV. Um, so what does my job look like? I'm gonna exclude anything that is the running my business side of it, because that's not really relevant to you. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what it's like to just be a day-to-day -day software developer. Uh, and so it usually involves a fair amount of um, being assigned something to do or having a project on your plate. Usually it's not, I need to do this today. It's more like, I need to kind of solve this abstract problem with code over the course of the next few weeks. So there's a lot of time management involved, even if you're just starting out because the reality is most stuff doesn't get solved in a day. Programming is a lot like solving a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, it's a very much chip away at it. You kind of have a framework and outline. You do the edges first, right? Hopefully you all do the edges first and do your, when you do your jigsaw puzzles. Um, and then along the way, you slowly fill in the gaps and some spots are easier than others. You know, if you're doing a, a, a jigsaw puzzle of the world map, you kind of leave the oceans to the end. It's just a bunch of blue that's really hard to differentiate. Right, you do the interesting stuff first when you do a jigsaw puzzle. And programming is that way too, because you realistically, you work on chunks that you can identify and then you make sure it fits and you don't always think it goes where you think it's supposed to. And over time, you really start narrowing it down. And the day-to-day -day job looks a lot like that. I'll be working on something, I'll be testing, I'll find some bugs, I'll try a bit more. I need to probably connect that with something someone else is doing and interact with them in the same way. I need to make sure that uh, all these interactions are all working together and that can that that's the fun right and if, you know when you get to the end and you say ha huh, I'm done the puzzle uh, that's usually not the most exciting moment right it's almost like the second last piece or the last piece is really exciting you don't write near the end even the last couple pieces are so obvious the fun's not even there anymore and you get to the end you look at the puzzle like oh what do I do with it now you take a picture of it and you move on so software development has that sort of flow to it. It's a lot of uh, collaborating and working through and chipping away at a complex problem with code. Um, and that really takes a long time to get good at, okay? A uh, lot of self-motivation, a lot of um, research. People don't talk about so much of software development is, is Googling. I kid you not, um, because there's no way you're gonna keep an entire reference library in your head. There's no reason to, it's all online. So when I'm working through a problem, I spend more time than you can probably imagine staring at my computer, sometimes thinking about it uh, with a whiteboard. I have a giant whiteboard in my office, uh, pieces of paper, working through it, talking about it, because the theory is that you should know what you're trying to solve before you start typing. 
and uh, that oftentimes doesn't get discussed enough. It's a lot of it's it's a lot of planning, right? And when you actually do start writing code and you start testing it, then you have hopefully this infrastructure around that lets you know you're doing it right. So, um, for example, let's say you're going to do something simple, like you're going to make an, an, an like a simple app to track to do items. Well, how do you know if it's working? How do you know if I check that box off, it's supposed to work? And so there's an entire infrastructure around making sure it's working. So after you write the code, you probably spend two to three times the amount of time testing it, working with it, making sure it's meeting what you expected it to meet in terms of goals. Um, and it's a lot like writing an essay in that way. You know, they always say like the first draft is the easiest and then you have to edit, edit, edit. And in programming, there's lots of testing and debugging and testing and debugging. So that's a lot of what my day looks like uh, being a software developer day to day. The other part of my time is actually dealing with things I didn't expect. Uh, and that really depends on the severity. So uh, commonly referred to as bugs, right? And a bug isn't a bug until someone else uses it. it sounds like a bit of a no -star. I write a bunch of code, you know, I start working with it, that's great. Uh, and then I put it out in the world or I share it with my other colleagues or, you know, I share it with a small beta test group, whatever it may be. You write some code and you put it out there. When it was just your code and wasn't working, you were just coding. Once someone else starts using it, it's now a bug because it's impacting someone else. And so a portion of what your life will be will be responding to things that other people found in which your code isn't doing what they expected. Um, and that comes in a bunch of different ways and a bunch of, you know, depending on how what size of organization you're looking you're working for, depending on the kind of bug, it may uh, it may have different impacts. So, for example, if you have a security issue that gets really serious in a hurry. You kind of drop everything you're doing, you solve it. If, you know, someone clicked a button and they expect to do something and it didn't do something, you know, less severe. Uh, but either way, it's, it's an iterative process. And that really becomes a lot of fun. And so that's where a lot of this stems from. And that's what uh, the day-to-day -day really looks like. A lot of communication, lots of testing. Uh, yeah, so that's that was mainly the points I wanted to talk about. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Hillary, is there, uh, how do we sort of do this from here? I didn't really have uh, uh, anything else to really say unless people have something specific they want to know about. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to uh, throw at Paulo? You can either uh, type it out or jump on video. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, thing. what are your favorite ways to communicate with uh, your coworkers remotely while, while working from home? Yeah, so our whole company is set up to be remote from the beginning, so uh, we're fortunate in that way. We didn't have a central office. So communication uh, varies depending on what you're doing. And in programming, there's a whole secondary layer around communicating. So in general, we avoid email at all costs. Email is the worst. It is very inefficient. Uh, hate it. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, there's different tools that different companies use. A uh, common one is something called Slack, where people can sort of share and discuss and you make a channel for different topics. Um, and within our group, we have different channels for each project. And then we have a separate programming channel for each other. So we can just talk about programming problems because if we're making a website for someone and we have to talk about a bunch of problems, most people don't want to see programmer chatter because it is incomprehensible oftentimes. And when we do have to talk about something, it ends up being quite a lengthy conversation, lots of back and forth. So it tends to hog conversations. We make separate channels for those. Once something becomes a really long conversation, I cannot stress enough the importance of just getting on the phone. So we will oftentimes uh, do a video call and we will share a screen. And the reason being is as someone who is mentoring other developers, the value is in them sharing their screen, me sort of talking through what they're doing, looking at their screen, looking at their code, and then giving feedback. It's like, okay, I see what you're doing there. So here's where you have a problem. Um, that's really good for collaborative work. Uh, and the other interesting thing is uh, for developers specifically, there's an entire other infrastructure uh, for where we store our code called repositories. And the most common one is something called Git. Uh, if you've heard of it, then you've used it. If you haven't, essentially it lets us, whenever we make changes to code, commit that code to a repository. There's a permanent history and it says line by line what you changed, what was modified. You put a comment around it saying like, hey, this is what I did. And then everyone can see it. And there's an entire infrastructure around reviewing code 
that's been committed and changed. Um, uh, and so that's one of those things that really helps because it provides infrastructure around code review because it's really hard to tell. Uh, you know, if you think about other industries where you're going to mentor someone like uh, in graph design is a good example. I can look at your work and I can see what you did and I can give feedback. Coding is really hard to review and collaborate on sometimes because it can very much be behind the scenes. Um, oh, we do have a couple of questions flowing in on the chat yeah. here now. I see uh, so yeah. Amit's asking um, if you could talk about internships in software development companies. Yeah, so the first rule is don't work for free. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, if someone's doing work, they get paid. I don't care what their experience level is, you get paid. I'm going to say that first and foremost. It's really important. Um, so internships are challenging. And the reason that they can be challenging is because they're really about mentorship. Uh, and we're going through this right now. We just hired a summer student from, from the University of Winnipeg, and they'll be joining us for the remainder of the summer. And we're very committed to the fact that a lot of that is uh, a mentorship role. So when you're looking at internships, you're looking at, you know, how do I go and work for a, a company? You kind of want to come from a perspective of, well, what will I be doing specifically? Because you want to make sure that what you're doing is somehow relevant to your education because that's why you're there, but that you're also contributing to their success. And so you don't want to get into an internship where you actually don't get to write code or learn about the systems in some way. So, um, you know, the worst case scenario is you sign up for an internship, you think you're going to be doing something great, but actually you're just doing data entry. That's not software development. It's an important part. It has to happen, but and it may expose you to something, but you want to make sure that the that you're actually doing something that benefits your education too. So I always say, you know, every job interview, every sort of thing, no matter what you're doing, it's always a two way street, right? You're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Because um, you have to make sure you're in the right kind of organization that's going to do the right kind of thing. So it's important to find out who you'll be, you know, directly reporting to, because that will sort of influence how you interact, right? Ideally, you should be talking that person. That person should be talking to you before you say yes or no to any kind of internship because it will really depend on what kind of software they're building, right? Uh, different environments have different ways in which you can be a valuable intern. So uh, let's use example of a gaming company, right? If you go work for a gaming company, um, some people's dream would be, you know, game testing. It's like, wow, I get to play video games all day. Well, the reality is, um, you might very well end up playing video games, but you're actually probably playing a broken video game. Like it's not a very enjoyable experience if you're doing like quality testing because you're going to do something, run into a problem, stop what you're doing, go file a report or a support ticket and, and then work through it there. So the main thing that I would say about internships is make sure that you're not excited about the company alone. You're also excited about what you'll be doing within that company and that will make sure you end up in the right role. Uh, what important information do you analyze when reviewing code? Um, the first thing I would say is that is very much contextual. By that I mean um, what you're looking for should be known ahead of time. So before you and there's a there's um there's a concept called test driven development, which means you shouldn't write code unless you know how you're going to test it. Okay. And that's and the same thing. You shouldn't write code until you know what you're trying to accomplish with it. So when you're analyzing code, if you're, you're testing it for functionality, you would be looking at is it doing what it promised it would do. Really important. Uh, and then if you don't know what those metrics are, you have a problem. You have to do more paperwork. You have to go and write things down and say, okay, this is what we're trying to accomplish. This is how it's going to look. This is how it's going to work. Separate from that, as someone who's in a senior position, I would. Uh, end up working through their code and looking for um, things that affect consistency. You know, did they comment it well? Are they, you know, are there things in their code that could cause problems later on? I sort of look for code quality and that requires a human to look at it and say like, did you write the code the right way? That's sort of the kind of stuff we look for writing code. There's functional testing and then there's uh, long term uh, making sure they're following standards kind of tests. Next one. I've heard people saying that you should enjoy your career that you choose. I've worked with computers. I know it can be really stressing. Do you enjoy what you're working on now? Ah, 
yes, I love my job. I love my work. Now that's not to say I love all aspects of my work. I also run a company. Taxes suck. It's just the worst. Um, I don't know how accountants do it. Bless their hearts. Um, so you will never love all that you do. But if you don't love the day to day, that's the problem. OK, so what I would always say is make sure that um, you enjoy the small victories, right? You enjoy the in between moments and not just the big final hurrahs because it can be fairly anticlimactic because the final hurrah is really after three months of testing. It's not like when you first build it, you build something great. It works. That's a very enjoyable moment. So you should enjoy those little moments. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read into that question a bit and I'm going to say if you enjoy working with computers, there is a breadth of options there and you might not want to be a programmer. You might want to be someone who works in IT. You might want to be someone who works in hardware. Um, there is a whole range of stuff involving computer knowledge that you should look into and don't think that just because it's involving computers that it's going to be software development because coding is its own weird sort of world and you should know that you enjoy that specifically. Um, how to apply internship to your company. Uh, we are a small company of six people. Uh, this is the first time we've hired a summer student um, and that was still something we only felt comfortable doing once we had enough infrastructure, infrastructure in place to support them. I think with most small organizations like ours, uh, we would end up being someone who would do it via uh, university students and uh, someone who's already a couple of years into the university degrees. Uh, the reason being is that because we don't have a giant infrastructure to support them, um, we need to make sure that they have enough of a technical capability to jump in. And for us, making sure we meet the other half, when we brought someone on, we have a specific thing we want them to do this summer. And so we know that that person's gonna work on this thing. And if there's more time, it's gonna be this thing. Um, and that's why just having someone jump in and start applying work, uh, it's not very effective. It's It does them a disservice too. How do you keep your programming and technical knowledge up to date? Ah, fantastic question. Well, the reality is that you don't as much as you think you would. Um, the reason being is that very early on, especially when you're learning, especially when you're trying to figure stuff out, there is an intense amount of learning that happens, right? And experimenting. That's what you're in that like try stuff out phase. Uh, and some of the stuff you'll learn by the time you, you know, four or five years down into your career, some of it will be obsolete. Things change. And it, it's a very quickly evolving industry. So the notion that you need to stay up to date on everything is a bit of a fallacy. It's actually not true. Because what ends up happening is you end up using a certain set of tools that you use. Uh, and most companies have a, a specific set of tools. They've built things on those tools. Like we have tools we've built stuff on. And the trying to like switch to the latest and greatest or change it around is actually a very daunting problem that tends to create more issues than it solves. So there are a few different ways that I, myself in general, that I try to keep up to date. One of it is one way is by bringing in other people who have had a different experience than mine. Uh, you know, different voices, different opinions are really important because the things that someone learns in school now is going to be very different than the things that you learn uh, that I learned when I went through school. So someone coming through and saying like, oh, you know, why don't we do this? Uh, and I'm like, oh, and then I enable them. I tell them like, go look into it. Tell me more like convince me that this would be great and we will go through the effort to change if necessary and then the other thing that i personally do and i recommend is to actually do events uh, like this conferences uh, things where you put yourself in a room with an expert and hear what they have to say so for example in february right before the world shut down i was at a conference uh, in montreal that was a developer conference it was specifically a web developer conference and so i spent four days sitting in rooms listening to other people who knew more or less but different information than what I have and that's really important and a lot of times I went into sessions where something might not apply to me but I didn't know enough about it and so sometimes I went into sessions just to hear someone talk about something and to convince myself like that's great but I actually don't need that tool. Um, and that led to a lot of, we use an entirely new testing tool based out of that conversation um, because I got, I spent, spent a day long workshop learning on stuff. So you have to put yourself in rooms with people with different experiences than you in whatever way that works. And that's, that's the biggest benefit. That's how you sort of keep up to date. 
there's always more stuff to consume. There's always more people telling you what's the latest and greatest. Uh, you gotta just, you, you can't just chase that. You'll you'll never get great at anything. You only get passable at anything. Awesome. I think that that's a really great note to uh, to wrap up on today. To to keep learning and to keep absorbing information, even if you know maybe you're unsure about it or you don't know if it's for you. Just you know, give it a shot. Try it out. I think that's that's wonderful. And I also would love to say congratulations to Luscious Orange on your anniversary. I hope that you all celebrate safely and virtually uh, today. You know, as best you can. Um, and I also just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, and please be sure to check out the exhibitors and the other presentations because uh, we've got this going on, uh, all sorts of different presenters going on until about 3.30 today. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, you can find all the other presenters on the, uh, the uh, EPIC website. Um, so take care, everybody, and stay safe. And